Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. And uh, Governor, thank you so much for being here. We truly appreciate it. And so um, we're looking forward to the presentation this morning. And uh, there's a lot before us. And working for Michigan families is, I think, all of our key number one priority. And so um, it's off to the races as we go. So um, Representative Hernandez, would you like to say? I'd just like to, to thank the governor and her staff for being here today. We look forward to starting this process off on a good foot, and we look forward to working with you over the next several months. Senator Hertel. I can get the show on the road, but thank you, Governor. Uh, the House Democrats are very excited for this process, and we're eager to hear the budget. All right. We'll call the meeting to order. Uh, Scott, will you please take the roll? Chairman Thomas. Here. Senator Bumstead. Here. Senator McGregor. Here. Senator Barrett. Here. Senator Bison. Here. Senator Lasada. Here. Senator McDonald. Here. Senator Nesbitt. Here. Senator Altman. Here. Senator Ronstead. Here. Senator Schmidt. Here. Senator Victory. Here. Senator Hertel. Here. Senator Ollier. Here. Senator Irwin. Here. Senator Santana. Here. Senator McCann. Here. And Senator Baer. Mr. Chairman, you have 18 members present. You have a quorum. Thank you. Representative. The House Appropriations Committee will come to order. Mr. Clerk, please take the roll. Chair Hernandez. Here. Representatives Miller. Here. Inman. Here. Albert. Here. Aller. Here. Brand. Van Singel. Here. Whiteford. Here. Yarick. Here. Bolin. Here. Glenn. Here. Green. Present. Heisinga. Here. Leitner. Here. Maddock. Here. Slaw. Present. Van Workham. Hoadley, Howdy. Love, Present. Pagan, Here. Hamoud, Here. Peterson, Present. Sabo, Here. Anthony, Here. Brixie, Here. Cherry, Here. Hood, Present. Kennedy, Here. Tate. Here. Mr. Cherry, quorum of the committee is present. Seeing all senators are present, uh, there's no need for excused absences. Representative. Seeing no House members absence, there is no need for excuse absences. Governor, welcome, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you for being here this morning. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to come and present the budget that we are introducing. I am joined by Chris Kolb, who is the director of the budget office, and Kyle Jen, who is the deputy director. I want to start by thanking the chairs, uh, Chairman Stamas and Chairman Hernandez, as well as the vice chairs, Hertel and Hoadley. Appreciate the work that you do. And to everyone on this committee, I want to thank you for your service. Uh, this is an incredibly important committee. Having sat on it 16 years ago in the seat that you are in right now, um, I know that we had to make a lot of tough choices for the people that we serve. And no doubt 2020 is going to present a lot of tough decisions as well. But I'm confident that we can work together to uh, make Michigan a place where our families thrive, our kids stay, and others come to for opportunity. Because we were all selected by the people of Michigan because they believe we have the ability to lead. I know every one of us wants to rise to that challenge and seek the opportunity that is inherent in a state at the crossroads to build a Michigan, as I said, where a hardworking person can get ahead. I live by the motto, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And today's budget is a real plan. It starts with understanding the magnitude of the issues that we are confronting, identifying our goals, and working together to enact real solutions so that we meet those goals. I want to direct your attention first to the mural that you have in front of you. It should be in your packet and the audience can see it not very easily on those um, monitors. If you look from left to right, on the left-hand side is the Michigan legacy that we all know and love and that we are proud of, the Michigan that we're proud to represent and call home. At the center of the page, it shows a Michigan at a crossroads, which is where we are today. We have a decision to make. We can either continue down a path of disinvestment, ignoring festering problems with our roads and our schools and our drinking water, accepting a skills gap that continues to grow, 
and being in a state where too few people are on a real path to a high wage skill, undermining our economic growth and our ability to compete, and where families across the state are struggling just to get by. Or we can choose a new path where we make the bold investments that solve the undeniable problems that are facing our state where we improve our public education system so that every student is getting the education they deserve. We close the skills gap and put every Michigander on a path to a good paying job and help businesses find the talent they need. Where every community has clean, safe drinking water. And yes, where we fix the damn roads. It will not be easy. It won't happen overnight. But this budget represents our best opportunity to forge a new path here in Michigan. First, we need to recognize the severity and magnitude of the problem we face. Let's start by looking at the 2020 budget plan, a very rudimentary glance. You'll see that there's $10.7 billion in the general fund, 10.9 in restricted funds, 14 in the school aid fund, 23.1 in federal funds, and 1.5 coming from others, all for a total of $60.2 billion. Now I know that $60 billion sounds enormous, and it is a big number. It is deceptive, though, and here's why. When you focus on the general fund line, that is the line where we have our discretion, where we fund some of the most important things that we do as a state. And when you look closely at that general fund line, you see that it has not changed in 20 years. 20 years ago, it was $10.7 billion as it is today. That's the part of the budget that funds things like health care for the most vulnerable, higher education and post-secondary attainment, the Michigan State Police that keeps us all safe, foster care, mental health, the Michigan Agriculture and Rural Development Department, which protects our food supply, just to name a handful of things. That general fund is the same size as it was 20 years ago. Let that sink in. If we had simply kept up with inflation since 2000, it would be about $5.6 billion higher than it is now. That's just keeping up with inflation. In that same period of time, the cost of everything else has gone up, while the general fund has remained stagnant. Instead of ensuring balance and investment, our predecessors played shell games. They took temporary victories at the cost of long-term security and selfishly spun the situation while pushing the cost onto us, to our children, and to those who can least bear them. And our problems are getting worse. Our roads are downright dangerous. Our students are falling behind. We have families across our state that cannot trust the water coming out of their taps. And to further complicate matters, IT needs plague all of our departments. Lawsuits against the last administration potentially in the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, will come due on our watch. We have a number of units of local government and some school districts that are in precarious financial positions. And all of these things are complicated by the spending that happened on the last day of last year. All of these things severely undermine our ability to do the things that matter to our economic future. And so we need to acknowledge it. We need to acknowledge also that incremental fund shifts, like the ones we've seen in the past, won't fix the problems we're facing now. They will only slow our decline. And I, for one, have no interest in managing the decline of the state that I love. We have to act now and we have to act quickly, or the problems we are facing are going to get much, much worse. Problems like our roads. Right now, we are in the bottom five in our country when it comes to investing in our infrastructure. I know that you have a document in front of you that shows and the audience is looking at that as well. Michigan ranks 46th out of 50 states 
in the amount spent on highways per capita. And we are dead last in the Midwest. The quality of our roads is the worst. So we've got more work to do than any other state in the nation. Michigan kids are falling behind because our state has not been investing in the K-12 education system. In fact, the school aid fund has been robbed to fill other budget holes for 10 years. Out of the 50 states, we ranked dead last in revenue growth for K-12 schools between 1995 and 2015. And, not coincidentally, in that same period of time, our kids have paid the worst price because we have fallen precipitously over the last 20 years. Every other state in the nation is meeting their kids' needs better than we are. Michigan also was once known for having the best skilled workforce in the world. We boasted amazing and affordable institutions for post-secondary certificates and degrees. But today in Michigan, too few of us have the skills we need, and our take-home pay reflects this. And as a state, we are missing out on opportunities for investment because of this. We're not getting enough students on the paths to good paying jobs. There is dignity and prosperity in many lines of work, but we've failed to ensure that every hardworking Michigander has a real path. The vast majority of today's jobs require some form of post-secondary degree or certificate. But as of 2016, only 44% of our adult population has completed that. So we are a state at the crossroads. We have a decision to make when it comes to this budget. If we choose to continue down the path that we're on, our roads are going to get much worse, and it's going to cost more to fix them. I know that might be hard to believe, but I want you to look at the slide in your document that I believe is the ninth slide in there. The industry standard when it comes to roads is 90% should be at good or fair condition. Today, our roads are at 78%. And I know that's hard to believe because it feels like they're even worse than that. There is no such thing as status quo when you're talking about roads that are deteriorating. Doing nothing doesn't mean you stay at 78%. It means we continue to decline. In just two years, if we do nothing today, other than what's been done in the past, we declined 65%. That's 13 point drop in the next two years. The year after that, it's another five points. In just three years, it'll be 60% of our roads from 78% today. The simple truth is, if we wanna fix the damn roads, we must invest in our infrastructure. The goal is 90% of our roads at good to fair, which means a spend level of $2.5 billion additional, with 1.5 of those going to state roads. The next slide has a lot of headlines, and I know you've seen them. Right now, our roads are deteriorating in front of us. You drive over the state line into Michigan, or get off the tarmac at any airport when you come into Michigan or just drive for five minutes out there, you know it. We all know someone who's been sidelined by a busted rim or a broken windshield or a flat tire. We've all shelled out hundreds of dollars to fix our cars when we should be fixing the roads. This is a road tax we are paying. Every one of us is paying a road tax in the form of higher auto repairs, new tires, or collisions. Our roads are costing the average motorist an extra $562 a year. And if you're in metropolitan Detroit, it's $865 a year. And this doesn't even factor in lost time or productivity. And this is the worst kind of road tax you can pay because it doesn't actually fix the roads. Crumbling infrastructure impacts every single one of us. Not one of us is immune. And if you look at the next slide, you'll see a picture of where the road problems are in Michigan. 
They are in every district in every part of our state. Last year, the American Society of Civil Engineers gave Michigan infrastructure an overall grade of D plus. That was the highest grade we got. Our roads were even worse at D minus, with just 18% in good condition. Another recent study concluded what we know, Michigan has the worst roads in the country. And the scariest part of that is if we don't act now, it will get worse. Over the next decade, the share of Michigan highways and trunk lines in poor condition will more than double, worsening the severity of the danger and costing drivers in our state even more. We're also, we're also facing another crisis here in Michigan. Our kids are falling behind. Michigan schools rank in the bottom 10 nationally in test scores. Michigan ranks last in the nation in school funding growth since 1995. Funding for school operations is the same level it was in 2007 without any adjustment for inflation. Underfunded special education programs are forcing schools to redirect resources. And funding for at-risk students has fallen by 60%. Our goal has got to be taking Michigan from bottom 10 in our country to top 10 in educational outcomes for our students. Just as it's been said that a rising tide lifts all boats, it's been proven that a concentration of talent improves the quality of life for everyone in higher incomes, greater innovation, better standards of living. We need to fill 15,000 jobs in the skilled trades every single year between now and 2024. And we are unprepared to meet that need today. So our goal, which I announced in the State of the State, is taking Michigan from 44% of our population to 60% of our population with some form of secondary, post-secondary certificate or degree by 2030. We all have seen the headlines around education that our kids are falling behind and our schools don't have the resources they need. One thing that's not in those headlines is it's taken a toll on our teachers as well and our educators who are leaving the state in pursuit of better opportunities or who are not going into the career in the first place. We've got classrooms crammed with kids who need more face-to-face -face time with their teachers and our outcomes make us less competitive. The biggest threat to our state's future and our security is failing the next generation. We have a moral obligation to them and a practical one in our own interests. Let's talk about water. I'm always amazed that there are people who don't know that Michigan is home to 21% of the world's fresh water in and around our borders. And despite that, right now we've got a lot of communities that cannot drink their water or don't trust it, whether it's because of PFAS contamination leaching into the groundwater, or it is because of old infrastructure leaching lead into the tap that is coming to our homes. This particular map is a map of PFAS investigation sites in Michigan. What's not reflected here are all of the old infrastructure that we're coping with as well. Clean drinking water is a fundamental human right. Our goal needs to be 100% of our communities can have confidence in the cleanliness of the water coming out of their taps. The water headlines impact us in the state, but tell the world um, it undermines our, our story of pure Michigan. When moms can't bathe their children or turn on the tap and give their kids a glass of, dinner, of water at the dinner table. When families are shelling out money for bottled water because they can't use the water in their home or when we find lead in the water in our schools. Now these hard truths undermine all of the good that is happening in our state. And there is a lot of good happening in Michigan. But these undermine it, and that's why we've got to get serious about solving these problems. They impact every one of your constituents. There's no doubt that the enormity of this problem is staggering. If we're going to solve these problems, if we expect anyone to invest in Michigan, we've got to invest in ourselves. 
and I have a plan that will get us to 90% of state roads in good and fair condition by 2030. When we do that, we will have the means to ensure that every community has clean drinking water, 100%. We will close the skills gap and take Michigan from bottom 10 to top 10 in education. The budget I'm introducing today actually solves these problems that we are facing. It is an honest, real solution. No more gimmicks. And I want to say this, contrary to political rhetoric that should be behind us, I can tell you this, no one likes to raise taxes. I wish I didn't have to come here today and put this budget before you, because I know it's hard. But the hard truth is we've got to get to work. Every day we don't, we are jeopardizing our economic future, wasting our money, and endangering our people. No more shell games and half measures. Here's a real plan. So at an average cost of $2.35 a gallon in January of 2019, annual prices at the pump are the lowest they've been in years, saving Americans billions of dollars. I propose that we leverage those low prices and invest in our roads to make them safer for drivers. Meeting this challenge will require a significant commitment of us all. And while it is one I am confident we can get to over time, I recognize that it is too great to bear in one fell swoop. So I propose raising the fuel tax 15 cents a gallon every six months from October 1st of this year to October 1st of next. With this kind of an investment fully implemented, the average driver will spend $23 a month. To mitigate the costs for low-income families, I'm proposing that we double the earned income tax credit from 6% to 12% over that same period of time. That will save families $30 a month offsetting the $23 increase that they will feel at the pump. We're going to repeal the retirement tax, which will save 400,000 households an average of $65 a month. And fixing the roads means we're going to bring down the cost the average driver spends per year on car repairs. So the average person in our state will feel relief when we do this and we do it right. While Michigan roads and bridges stand out for being the worst in the nation, Michigan is not unique or the first state to propose raising taxes to meet the burden. I just returned from the National Governors Association meeting in Washington, D.C. a week and a half ago, and every governor was talking about the skills gap and the infrastructure problems. And they are forging ahead. Not one of them has the crisis that we have in Michigan. And so while they continue to move forward, we've got to make up that ground and move forward as well. Many states across the country have adopted or proposed a gas tax increase. That is reflected on that document and on this screen. These are just a few examples of what they are doing. The states in red are led by Republican governors. The states in blue are led by Democratic governors. And you can see it is a bipartisan effort to fix the fundamentals. Governor DeWine in Ohio has proposed 18 cent gas tax increase to fix Ohio's roads and bridges. And Ohio's roads are a heck of a lot better than ours are. Leaders across the country, regardless of party, understand that this is necessary to protect our citizens and to compete. Passing this budget will stabilize, will stabilize things in Michigan and enable us to address many other of the issues that we confront, like the education crisis. This budget represents the biggest investment in education of our kids in a generation. In a generation of Michigan kids, this is the biggest investment. That means that the resources of between $120 and $180 per pupil to fund fundamental classroom and operational expenses and additional support since we know it costs more to educate kids in poverty or with additional assistance needs 
I'm talking about kids who require special education support, at-risk students, and those in low-income areas, as well as students who need career and technical education to make sure they're well prepared for the workforce. That's why my budget, the budget that we're introducing today, includes a weighted funding system that recognizes the higher costs associated of educating these students. There's $120 million for special education students, $102 million for at-risk students, $50 million for CTE, and we jumpstart early literacy initiatives with an investment of $24.5 million to triple the number of literacy coaches in our schools. During my State of the State, I also announced a statewide goal of increasing the number of people with um, post-secondary credential between the ages of 16 and 64 to 60 percent by 2030. I outlined the My Opportunity Scholarship and the Michigan Reconnect in that speech. The Reconnect will help connect adults with the skills that they need and help businesses find the talent they need. The My Opportunity Scholarship to be implemented in 2021 will make Michigan the first state in the Midwest to offer debt-free community college. We can finally get to work closing the skills gap here in Michigan so everyone can build a good life for themselves right here. Slide 23 is not interactive on the paper in front of you, but when you go to the budget website, you'll see that it is. What this slide does is give every one of you and your constituents and the general public the ability to see how much this budget impacts their district. Every district is far ahead because of this budget, and they can go and see what it means to them, and I encourage you to do that as well. We've highlighted, although it's hard, very difficult to see with the small print, uh, the leaders of appropriations districts, but you can see yours as well. With this budget, we can also get to work cleaning up our drinking water. I'm presenting a supplemental budget, including $120 million to improve our drinking water infrastructure so we can start cleaning up drinking water in communities across the state. This will include funding for service line replacements, research and treatment of PFAS, research to optimize water distribution systems, and will dedicate $60 million to install hydration stations in school buildings. This will be a chance to turn a new leaf and prove to people that we will finally clean up their drinking water. With this budget proposal, taxpayers can see that the dollars are actually going to where they are intended. That is a frequent and legitimate criticism that people have of how the state budget has operated in the past. Dollars that are intended for one purpose frequently get moved around. This budget takes a big step to ensure that the dollars are accountable and spent in the way the public believes that they are going to be spent. Roads will be funded by road money, constitutionally dedicated restricted funds public universities to be funded by the general fund, and the $500 million school aid fund dollars will be returned so that pre-K to 14 schools will get the investments that they need. This will help us earn back the confidence of the people we represent and will be able to be held accountable and they can track it. So we have a choice to make today. Maybe not today, but in the spring or summer before we take a break, I hope. We can put Michigan on the path to prosperity to help people get ahead and attract more business to Michigan. Or kick the can down the road and watch as our roads get worse, our kids fall further behind, and more and more communities find problems with their drinking water. This is about one historic vote I know how difficult your job is. I had your job. I'm not asking something that is easy. I get that. But I also know this. The worst vote a legislator can take is a vote that proposes to solve a problem that doesn't actually fix it. Or even worse than that, perhaps, 10 votes that are cobbling together a solution that falls short of fixing a problem. 
And that's why we wrote this budget so it requires one historic vote, that when you pull that lever, we fix a lot of problems in the state of Michigan. I think we have an opportunity to get this done and to show the world that divided government doesn't have to look like what happens in Washington, D.C. every day. Because that kind of government hurts families and an economy that is trying to grow. It undermines confidence and compromises the future of our state. We have a chance to make Michigan a model for bipartisanship, and we must. Because in the state where people once flocked to, to be a part of the American dream, families currently can't drink from the tap in many communities. People who want to work can't afford the skills training they need to fill jobs that are vacant. There are children in our state who can't read and drivers who are getting crushed by repair bills. Each of these is a barrier to the American dream. We have an obligation and an opportunity. This is not easy. If it was, our predecessors would have done this, and they would have done it right. But they did not. And so it is up to us. We have a lot of work ahead, and there will be plenty of voices against us taking this step. But every great leap, every great leap in our shared history happened in spite of the naysayers of the day. It happened because courageous leaders did what they knew to be the right thing. I didn't seek this office because I wanted to be governor. I ran for governor because I love this state and I want to fix problems. I know that Michigan will never truly be a successful state unless we are a state of successful people. We each got elected because the voters think that we are the ones that can solve this problem. Let's prove them right. Mr. Chairman and Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for letting me come and address you and present my budget for 2020. Thank you, Governor. We appreciate it. And uh, I understand that you have to step out. And so um, would you like to take a couple questions? Or I, I know that you've gone a little past, so you may be pressed for time. I'm looking, I don't, I'm sorry to say that I do not have time. However, I'm leaving you in the capable hands of the budget director. We appreciate and that. I am always um, interested in connecting, and so I'm happy to do that. Thank you, Governor. As, this, as we move through the process. So thank you very much. We look forward to working with you. Director, are you ready? <laughs> All right, please proceed. It's your. There we go. See, I'm not used to being on this side of the table. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, both of the chairs, the minority vice chairs, the vice chairs of the appropriations, distinguished members of both the Senate and House appropriations. Uh, it was just around 20 years ago uh, that the governor and I were both elected to the legislature and we would serve together on, on the House Appropriations Committee. Uh, so it's a real honor to be before you and understand the task you have in front of you. If you'll give me just a moment, I, I'd like to recognize that we have members of the governor's cabinet with us. And then just as importantly to me, is I have members of my team at the State Budget Office with us uh, as well today. And I want to recognize them, because without their work, this budget presentation, this budget would not be before you. When there were snowstorms stopping people from getting the work, they were here. When it was freezing out and government was shut down, they were here. They work long hours, seven days a week, to make sure this budget gets done, regardless of who the governor is. There are no more dedicated state employees than the state budget office, and they represent the people and women that we employ around the state. And as one individual, I recognize them and appreciate all that they have done for me and for the state and for administrations past and future. So I just wanted to, to give, have them be recognized. So we're going to start off with uh, the first slide, which gives you the fiscal 2020 budget. As the governor pointed out, 
It is a $60.2 billion uh, budget. It's in a 3.6% increase. If you take out the transportation funding, it's a 2.5% increase. The general fund is at $10.7 billion, which is up 2.3%. As the governor pointed out, that's where it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, when we were both elected to the legislature, it was 10.7. This fiscal year, the bu general budget will still be $10.7 billion. Uh, for your information, inflation is, is around 2.2 right now. So let's break down the budget for you. We had it in percentages. Now let's look at how those dollars break down. Total budget is $60.2 billion. If you look at the federal uh, funds, that's $23.1 billion. School aid fund is $14 billion. Restricted and other funds, $12.4 billion. The general fund, $10.7 billion. Our discretionary spending is in that, that fund. So breaking down the budget just a little bit more, uh, the general fund, over 80% of it are for health care, protecting vulnerable children and adults, public safety, and education. And I've pounded this, this point home maybe enough, but it's at the same point as it was 20 years ago, despite inflation. Let's get to the roads and infrastructure plan that the governor uh, put out there. For nearly 40 years, we've had a disinvestment in our infrastructure. Michigan, as we know, has some of the worst roads uh, in the nation, if not the worst. As the governor pointed out, the civil engineers have report, given us a report card of a D minus on the conditions of our roads. We rank 46th out of 50 states in per capita spending on roads. Currently, our state roads are at 78% good or fair condition, but they are forecast to get much worse if we don't do anything. Every day we fail to act, our roads get worse, and the bill goes up. You can pay now, or you can pay a whole lot more later on, and that's just a fact. The roads package that was adopted in, in 2015, really what it accomplished was slowing the decline. It did not improve them. There were not enough funds in there. The annual cost to fix our roads has been pegged to be north of $2 billion. The range of the analysis have shown a 2.2 to $2.7 billion. Those are from groups like the Michigan Infrastructure Council, Business Leaders of Michigan, the Citizens Research Council, and even the Senate Fiscal Agency had a report that showed that it was north of $2 billion. MDOT alone will require $1.5 billion annually to improve our state roads to 90% good or fair. There are over 600 local road agencies that need, lo that, that need money as well. Finding out exactly their condition is harder, but we know that it's a sizable ask there as well. I have an interesting graph here uh, that uh, the, the folks in the audience can see, but it shows if we had, inf if we'd, our original gas tax, if we had had it pegged for inflation, there's an area underneath the curve that's in gray. That represents the funds we would have had over the last 40 years. It's $30 billion, which is remarkably close to what we need in the next 10 years. So fixing our roads plan. We know that we have to raise as much money as we can early. It has to be a lot, and it has to come in fast. Because otherwise, your roads deteriorate. And the more roads that go into the poor condition, the more expensive it gets. And so we, having the governor's plan of 15, 15, 15 over 18 months will give us enough money to bring our state roads up to the 90% uh, goal of good and fair. If we don't, if we don't do anything or we don't do enough, the road conditions will continue to decline and it will be very hard to keep them at the current state. I don't believe that where our roads are today is anything we want to stay at. And if we don't do something, 
they're going to go down from that. In the area above the curve of the lowest line, everything below that is good and fair. The area above it are your poor roads. So the bigger that line, the farther that goes down, the more and more poor roads you have. And it's just a fact, it takes much more money to fix a poor road than it does to keep a good road in good condition or bring a fair road up to good. There will be a point what we will reach will be a point of no return, that there will not be enough money to fix our roads. We cannot let that happen. So I said funding the roads, we needed a predictable and a, and a source that was constitutionally dedicated to road funding. And so we've asked for a fuel tax increase of 15 cents per gallon for every six months for the next year. That will come up to 45 cents uh, a gallon totally. It will help us eliminate the general fund uh, earmark for roads. And you can see the phase in of this. And once again, this is for gas and diesel. When fully implemented, the governor's plan will raise $2.5 billion in new revenue. I want to point something out, that the current uh, fuel tax that's currently being uh, applied at 26 cents a gallon will stay in the Act 51 formula. The new revenue will go into a new fund, which we are calling the Fixing Michigan Roads Fund. So the old money stays with the old formula, the new money will stay, will go into the, the new formula. How will that impact your roads? Well, the new distribution, the new revenue, is being aimed at the most heavily traveled roads and the most economically important roads in our state, regardless of whether they're a state road or a local road. Drivers don't care who owns the roads. They want those roads fixed. And the distribution formula is laid out before you, but it goes by functionality. So we have interstates and, and other freeways. It's one category. Principal arterials are another. Minor arterials and major collectors. Local bridges has its own program. Transit rail and autonomous vehicles are addressed. And rural economic corridors are as well. What are some of these types of roads? Well, all of us come to Lansing. So 496, MLK, Cedar, Waverly here in Lansing, Capitol Avenue, Kalamazoo Street. Those are the type of roads we're talking about. And when we use our money for these roads, it's going to free up local dollars to fix local neighborhood roads. So they'll have more money to fix their roads that their citizens and residents depend on. We're also built in transparency and accountability. So this plan is both transparent and accountable. MDOT and the local road agencies will be asked to develop five-year plans that target the investment of these funds using sound asset management principles. The public will be able to find out which roads are being fixed and track the progress of each project based on an accessible website. We also know that we can't just say we're going to have, do something. So in five years, we are going to create a Fixing the Michigan Roads Review uh, Committee, whose job will be to make sure that we're on track, meeting our goals, we're spending the money like we said we did. And if we have to make adjustments, they will make those recommendations to us, and we will go forward uh, with those recommendations. We know, as the governor said, that this is going to impact uh, all of us. It's going to impact others, I think, harder than, than some of us. And so we do have an earned income tax credit uh, increase. It's a doubling of that uh, credit from 6% to 12%. It will go up 4% first year, and then it goes up 2% after that uh, to mirror the increase in the, the fuel tax. We also know that people on a fixed income will be impacted as well. And so we are eliminating the retirement tax uh, on seniors. More than 400,000 households, as the governor said, will save an average of $800. We are paying that by replaced by creating business tax parity. There is a currently a discrepancy between traditional corporations and business tax through entities. 
So we are going to have a new, you'll, you'll, have indiv you'll have individual income tax, you'll have some who will pay a corporate income tax, and then you have business pass-through uh, income tax. Those corporate income taxes will both be the same at 6%. For those folks now having to do the business uh, pass-through income tax, there's going to be a $50,000 deduction to help smaller businesses, and those, those taxes are deductible off your federal income tax uh, as well. So what are the other options that we have out there to, to raise uh, $2.5 billion? There's really only about six funds uh, that are available. And so we provided you what uh, you'd have to do utilizing other means to, to raise this money. On the individual income tax, you'd have to go from the current 4.25% up to 5.3%. Your corporate income tax, you'd have to go from 6% to 19.5%. Your sales and use tax would go from 6% to 7.5%. Maybe you want to do a new statewide property tax. It would have to be seven mills. The other fund we have is the vehicle registration uh, fees. Well, to get from where we are today, we'd have to go up 180% on vehicle registration. The governor did mention uh, that we're going to have a, a drinking water infrastructure uh, proposal for you. It's $120 million. What will it be spent on? Well, they, we're proposing to provide to locals $37.5 million to help them comply with the lead and copper rule that we revised just last year. Another $30 million would go to addressing PFAS and emerging contaminants, the treatment and cleanup. Uh, as you may know, 1.9 million residents in the state of Michigan have some level of PFAS in their drinking water. There's another part of the plan is to have $40 million for the drinking water revolving fund. It's a loan forgiveness plan. We know that there's a ton of need out there, but because of the requirement that locals have to pay everything back, we're not seeing the response. This is an incentive for them to, to come forward with their plans, and we'll cover the 30% the uh, of that uh, proposal. We also have money in for uh, planning and asset management, uh, so watershed planning, integrated asset management, affordable rate design, uh, and evaluation of best practices out there, and another component for research and innovation. The drinking water industry has an aversion uh, to innovation for a very good reason. You don't want to screw around with your drinking water. But we recognize that things have to, have to improve, and so we want to have a component that really looks at, at research and infusing innovation uh, in a way. So we want to partner with our research universities, with organizations like the Water Resource Foundation, where we can bring in a dollar and they'll match us with two, three, four dollars alone. And so we'll be able to, to build up and provide research and innovation in this area. There's another 1.9 million for drinking water compliance. And then as the governor mentioned, there is a school hydration uh, station uh, funding for $60 million, and this will allow us to, to install drinking fountain hydration stations in our schools so every kid will have an opportunity to have safe, clean drinking water without the cost of having to replumb all of our older schools. And education, we're proposing the largest uh, increase for school operations in a generation of students, it's a 3.6% uh, increase over last year's spending. It's an increase of the foundation allowance of $235 million on a 1.5x basis. So $180 per pupil for districts at the minimum and $120 for districts at the, mass at the maximum. It closes the gap between the, max, the minimum and the maximums to under $500 and moves all districts towards the goal of $9,590, which was the target laid out in the recent School Finance uh, Resource Collaborative study. Now, Michigan serves a diverse population of students. Some children need additional uh, assistance or resources to help them thrive. 
And so based on the recommendations in that school finance research uh, report, this budget includes a weighted funding system that recognizes the higher cost of educating these students. Special education, uh, kids often need assistance for academic support to one-on-one -on -one specialist. I know how important this is. I was a special education kid. I had speech therapy. I was lucky that my district was able to provide that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today. I may not have gone to college. I definitely wouldn't have been a state representative, and I probably would not here, as I said, be before you today. I know on a personal level that these types of supports matter. They matter to kids' success, their potential. And whether it's special education, whether it's at risk, or career tech, uh, technical training, these are important so that all kids, all kids have a chance for success in their lives. As we said, the special education reimbursement is $120 million. The at risk is $102 million. And the career and technical training is $50 million. And you can see on the graph how that adds up uh, for the increases, both the increase and the total amount we're proposing. We have a goal to triple the number of uh, state-funded literacy coaches in our schools, and so we have an increase from 30.9 uh, 30 million to 55.4 million dollars to do that, and we're expanding access to the Great Start uh, Readiness uh, Program, increasing from 245 million to 329 million, so that we can have more kids be eligible to go to preschool, and that we can give those uh, providers more money for those kids. Higher education. We are proposing a 3% increase for higher education for our public universities, a 3% increase for our community colleges, with a tuition restraint uh, of 3.2%, which is 1% plus inflation. We are they're proposing the creation of the Michigan uh, Reconnect program. Uh, as we said, this will provide opportunity for adults who are past uh, high school who want to seek additional training, certificate, you know, getting a certificate, or getting an associate's degree in specialized uh, careers. Uh, this will, they will receive tuition-free training for their certificate. And it's funded from the Talent Investment Fund. $110 million will be available to fund the first two years of the program. And we'll roll out next year the Michigan Opportunity An Initiative. University funding will go back to a 100% general fund, returning a half a billion dollars to the school aid and to our K-12 programs. Our health and safety and local government proposals, we're proposing an increase uh, in the purchasing power of residents receiving food assistance by investing another $4 million into the Double Up uh, Food Bucks uh, program. This will allow us to go statewide. It's a win for families, it's a win for agriculture, and it's a win for our local stores who will, who will have these uh, products available. We will protect our most vulnerable children and keep them together with their parents uh, when possible by investing in foster care and, and child welfare. We will do enhanced monitoring in response to environmental and public health uh, hazards. We are proposing another 50 person, 50 recruit uh, state police trooper school. And we are proposing enhancement of our secure communication network, which is utilized by our state's first responders at both the state and local uh, level. Local governments, revenue sharing. We are proposing a constitutional payment uh, increase of 3.2%, which is $27.5 million, and an increase in the statutory uh, payment to cities, villages, and townships and counties by 3%. The total increase is $41.8 million. It's important to us to, to be fiscally balanced as well. Michigan has a constitutional revenue limit, which was created in 1978. 
setting a cap on the total level of revenue collected from all state taxes and fees as a percentage of a total personal income in the state. We hit that level in the year 2000. We are right there. Even with all the tax changes we have proposed in this budget, we are, a, we are at $10 billion underneath that level. You can basically fit a whole nother general fund into this and not hit that, that level. Long-term balance. This budget is structurally balanced. We are using ongoing revenue to pay for ongoing cost. We have utilized $100 million in reductions and reprioritized those funds to meet critical needs. And we are making one time, using one-time revenue to make fiscally responsible deposits into the Michigan's Rainy Day Fund, into our School Employees Retirement Reserve Fund, and a $15 million deposit into the Flint Reserve Fund as well. We are returning funding to its intended purposes. Roads funding will be, we will use constantly, constitutionally protected and dedicated funds. Public universities will be funded 100% from general fund and half a billion dollars of school aid will be returned to our K-12 students. When enacted, this budget will be able to complete a lot of things. We create a checklist so that when this budget is enacted, we can say, fix the roads, check. Protect our waters, check. Improve our schools, check. Eliminate the retirement tax, check. Provide budget st st stability, check. We have set this budget in front of you to accomplish these goals, and we look forward to working with you as this process moves forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You also, just one, one other thing I do want to, you did find a bunch of these huge tubes behind you. Inside those tubes are maps that will show all the roads in your districts that are eligible under the, the Fixing Our Michigan Roads Plan. Thank you, Director. We appreciate it. Uh, we're going to open it up for questions at this time, and the chair will recognize Senator Bumstead for the first question. Thank you, Chairman Stamas. Uh, Director Kolb, thank you for coming in today. Appreciate uh, what you had to say on budget. But one question regarding rural roads. You know, I, I represented both when I was in the House and the Senate pretty rural areas, and everybody up our way really likes the money running through uh, Act 51. This, the new commission, there's kind of two questions here that I'm asking. Who's going to appoint this new commission? <coughs> and uh, will they be from all, the people that are elected, will they appointed, will they be from all around the state, different corners of Michigan? The, uh, maybe get to your, your first point uh, in a minute. The commission would be uh, appointed uh, by the governor, but as, a, as experts in, in transportation funding. And that's what we want is to bring in real experts. Uh, and they'll be part of the legislation in front of you will help uh, determine who's on that as well. But I do want to point out, and we we're talking about the funding, that the current 26 cents will still go through the Act 51 formula. So, so locals will get the money through that. And then the additional money will go to, to fund these other, these new priorities. But there is a component for rural economic corridors that we know that there are, there are roads in rural Michigan that are extremely important to those communities, and we want them to be part of this program as well. Thank you. Chairman Hernandez. Thank you, Budget Director Kolb, for your presentation. Thank you for taking the time for questions. Another questions regarding, a question regarding roads. Surprise, I think we all knew there'd be plenty of those. Um, I've had about a day to start digesting this, and I, I could be off on some of these numbers, but I think what I'm seeing is uh, an increase that creates $2.5 in revenue. But if I'm understanding this correctly, we're also talking about taking $600 million of revenue that was dedicated towards roads in a 2015 vote and pulling that back. And with that, we are feeling that's how we're covering the higher ed. We also have an earned income tax credit uh, that is put toward 
helping ease the pain of this 45 cent gas tax increase, it's starting to bring back memories to me of proposal one of 2015. And can, can you explain how this proposal is different from when we had a $2 billion tax crease, increase on the table that only a percentage of it actually went to roads? <coughs> well, the, the reason that we've set this up is that we're raising enough money that we can, we can address the general fund that's currently obligated. We are replacing that with this new revenue. That money then gets pulled back, that general fund gets pulled back, and we're able to pay for the universities out of that. That frees up you know, half a billion dollars to go back into to K-12. So all the things line up together and allow us to, to present to you a, a structurally balanced budget. Chair recognizes Senator Hertel. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, just if we're all stating our positions on Public Act 51, my constituents don't like it. The money going through that, and I would assume many of us on both sides of the aisle uh, that live in uh, more urban communities or Macomb, Oakland, other counties would feel the same way. So I think that there probably depends on where you live how you feel about that. Uh, that being said, I, I do want to commend um, this budget for being uh, uh, penny smart. Uh, and pound smart as well. And I think that uh, too often uh, we've looked at past administrations and we've been penny wise and pound foolish. And the investments in our roads and infrastructure and the graph that showed the costs going forward and where we're going to end up if we don't make these investments are incredibly important. I'm getting to a question. Um, it, it's a little detailed actually, but I want to give another example of that and highlight it and just try to get a little more understanding of it. Um, in the budget book, sorry to be nerdy. It's okay. uh, B, page B29, it's the Department of Health, Health and Human Services budget, the $2.2 million for the Center for Forensic Psychiatry. I can wait till you get there. I think I, it, this is incredibly important, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the cycle that we're in right now um, of... Uh, uh, basically waiting way too long for people to get the help that they need and then ends up, when, once they get there, that longer term cost, and it's a vicious cycle that moves forward. But I, I'm just trying to understand that the 2.2 million, is that to open up more bed space at the Center for Forensic Psychiatry or is that, there's some other part of it? I, I, I didn't get a whole lot of details in the description of exactly what it does. So I want to... It, it's basically, if I understand it, it is to increase the, the time or decrease the time that they get evaluated to see whether they're, they're ready to stand, if they're competent to stand trial or not. Too often, because we don't have enough uh, folks to do the evaluation, people are, stay, are stuck in jail for way too long before they have okay, their so it's evaluation. It's increasing FTEs there. If, if we could get, I'm sure we'll get this once we get through the budget process. I just want, if, if I could get and I think probably other members would probably want this, um, uh, a more detailed description of exactly what, how we're doing that. Uh, I think it's incredibly important, and uh, it's something that we've been working on for a long time, uh, and, I, and I commend that it's in the budget process. Uh, there's a whole wing there that could be reopened that I think would actually be quite helpful, and I'm not sure if that covers all the costs of that or if we're just looking at certain uh, aspects of it. So uh, if we can get more details on exactly what that looks like, I would yeah. appreciate it. I, I will let you know that in your, your packet, there are briefing papers on, on each of the components. In there, you will find one on the Department of Health and Human Services Center for Forensic Psychiatry. And on the back page, it tells you what that money is going to. Seven forensic psychologists to conduct the uh, evaluations. There's data director and other staff. This is all in your packet, and we've developed these for you. If there's more information you need, please contact us, and we'll get that uh, to you as well. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I only read this. There's a lot of papers up here. I guess I'm we, we, it is not to overwhelm you. It's to try to add, you know, ask, you know, answer your questions that you might have and inform you. Thank you, Director. Uh, Chair calls on Vice Chair Holdley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Director Kolb, thank you for being here. So we've talked a lot about roads. I want to talk about education for a second. Uh, particularly, I come from a family of educators, so it's important to me. Uh, 
In you briefly touched on increasing programs related to early childhood education. Uh, I think both expanding the quality and, and scope of who's eligible. Can you elaborate a little bit on that piece? Um, yeah, we will, because of the increase, uh, we will be seeing 5,100 more kids eligible for early childhood, and we'll be providing the first increase in rates in over six years. Chair recognizes Senator Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks for your presentation. I'm curious if you could go into a little bit more detail for me on how this new uh, business tax uh, structure would operate, what it would look like, and what a uh, typical business owner in my district might expect um, their position to change with these uh, proposals that you're setting forward today. Uh, sure. The, uh up to, I do believe, 2011, we, we treated corporations the same. With the, the change in 2011, we started to treat certain corporations differently. So your partnerships, your LLCs, and your S corporations were allowed to have their, pass, their income passed through uh, to their personal income tax. So instead of paying a 6% rate of, on the business income tax, they're allowed to pay a 4.25%, creating a you know, unequal playing field between corporations. So this would, would apply a 6% uh, tax onto those pass-through uh, incomes. Uh, but like I said, we know that will impact uh, businesses. So for smaller businesses, the first $50,000 is deductible, and you're able to uh, deduct on your federal income tax uh, these state taxes as well. Chair recognizes Representative Maddock. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Director Kolb. Uh, during the campaign season, uh, Governor Whitmer during one of our open debates, public debates, talk about a 20% gas tax increase, and she called it ridiculous. How can you explain a 45% tax increase today? What we want to do is propose a solution that actually fixes the roads. I've looked at multiple ways of doing this. Too many of them fall short. In fact, don't allow us to see improvement over time. If we're going to ask the residents of the state to pay more, they should be able to get success. This plan will allow us in 10 years to make sure that all state uh, roads, 90% of them, will be at good or fair. We understand it's a big jump. It's a hurdle. That's why we're phasing it in 15 cents. 15 cents and 15 cents. But there's no reason that we should ask for a lot of money and not be able to show results. And when we ran different scenarios with less money, we didn't stop the deterioration of a transportation system. We need to do this now. If we don't do it today and we try tomorrow, it will be even more. And there will become a day when we cannot afford to fix our transportation system. That's not a Michigan I want to live in. And I don't think it's a Michigan that you want to live in. I understand, and the governor understands, the enormity of what we're asking. But we want to provide a solution. And if you don't like this solution, then you can bring another one to us. But we need $2.5 billion. And there's only so many ways to raise that. And if you don't get the money in early, I can tell you, the deterioration just drags the entire curve down, and we can't even keep up to where we are, and we will go at 78, 75, 65, 60, 50 percent good and fair. That's just not acceptable. So we went to the governor and said, this is what we believe will get the job done. It's what MDOT believes will get the job done. I'm hoping that you will agree. And if you have a different plan, I think we'll, we'll look at it. But you're going to find, like I found, 
It's a very sobering moment that it's going to cost us to catch up for 40 years of disinvestment. Thank you. Chair recognizes Senator Nesbitt. I'm not the only one they had to remember to do that. I'm glad. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Director. The um, just some questions are being held out. Are, are you still going to treat private and public pensions differently in terms of the exemption? This is on the the pension. This is on the public pensions. Correct. If you're going back to pre-2011, you would treat everything. it differently. So you'd go back to treating public pensions to be exempt completely, and private pensions yes. only having a certain exemption. Yes. Okay. So there'd be still a disparity is, there. And then number two, you would still create create a, you know for seniors that are retired or, or seniors that are still working, their their income would be taxed. But if they happen to have a pension, they wouldn't be taxed. We basically keep the current deduction, so they're fine. Permanently for new people going in the system in 67? Go ahead. Well, the, um, at a high level, the, we're, we're reversing the changes made in 2011, but we're also keeping the deduction that was added uh, for other forms of retirement act. So you're going to see that uh, the, the uh, for foregone revenue is actually a little bit higher than than what was raised in 2011 to kind of have that hold harmless provision. So, so those, if a public employee retires, a former public employee from the 80s and 90s, making $120,000 a year in their pension, that'd be completely tax-free? Yes. Okay. All right. Chair recognizes Representative Love for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Director. Um, one of the tragedies of term limits is that sometimes uh, this history repeats itself, but I'm fortunate enough to be around to see it kind of repeat itself while I'm still serving. And uh, my colleague brought up Proposal 1. And I remember when that came through four years ago, we needed to raise then uh, about 41.9 cents um, on the gas tax. And so in this proposed um, tax of the uh, increasing us to 45 cents, it's kind of in line with what was predicted four years ago and as we head into that direction. But I have a, a question about how you plan or you're proposing to distribute that increase in the fuel tax. Um, trying to get to the page what happens when you just when you have Kyle pull it up for me but it's it's based on the functionality of the road using national functional uh, classifications of roads so the roads that, are, that people travel the most and see the most commercial traffic on are the ones that that we're going to focus on uh, so uh, as the slide you should be able to see it on the monitor 47 percent will go to interstate and other highways 30% go to principal arterials, which are your other major roads. Minor arterials and the uh, major collectors get another 14%, and local bridges is 4%. There's also 3% for transit rail and uh, mobility projects, and 2% for rural economic corridors. But it's really, regardless of who owns the road, it's what are the most heavily traveled and most economically important roads that we're going to concentrate with the new funds. Very good. Mr. Chair, may I ask a follow-up question? Okay. Thank you. Um, one of the most exciting things coming out of this budget for me is the plan for Rich Michigan Reconnect and how we're training um, and preparing our residents for the new economy and the skilled trades. Can you t speak a little more to that plan? Yeah, I mean, basically, we will pay uh, for their tuition uh, as they go to, to get either a certificate, an associate degree, or, or get trained in a skill so that these are individuals who have been out of, of high school uh, for a while, they're adult workers, whose skill set needs to be improved 
or change so that they are uh, employable in, in a high skill, high paying job. Uh, and we're paying for the first two years of it at $110 million from the, uh, the talent investment fund. Uh, so it's, you know, it's for those of us who have been out of school, we have a certain skill set. It doesn't line up with the skill set that's needed for jobs that are open today. And so we're providing a way to retrain folks to brush up on their skills and make them highly employable. That'll be helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. The chair recognizes Senator McGregor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I want to discuss uh, an item on, on the Department of Health and Human Services and some of your reductions, which are, some of them are a little confusing, but the one that sticks out the most is the, at least to start out, is going to be your hospice room and board funding or end of life care reduction. I was wondering if you could explain the reasoning behind a reduction. It's not a big reduction. It's not, it's just a tiny little bit in this very large budget, but why would an item like that be on the chopping block? So I, I would tell you, part of the, the hardest uh, part of this job is looking at uh, programs uh, that we think uh, might have to be reduced. Uh, in this case, there are a lot of programs within uh, uh, DHHS which are very important and good. We try to maximize the use of general fund to draw down federal dollars. So this program is 100% general fund. We have a priority to not fund programs that don't allow us to draw down. That doesn't mean this isn't a good program, an important program, but we have to have a way to make decisions and help to fund programs that help others as well as bring in some federal funds to start to meet all of the needs within that department and within our health services. So there are tough decisions that get made. We're open for discussions, but we have a, a decision-making process and this one, unfortunately, fell on the other side of that decision that you would like. And if I could, I would fund all of them. But we have more ass, more programs than we have money for. And so tough decisions have to be made. And uh, we try to be as, 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 as careful and as uh, you know, looking at all those needs. We, we have to just make some decisions someday. And, and this one just fell uh, that way. But as I said, we're open to discussions on it. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Dr. Chairman. Uh, I know that you have to leave shortly. We're down to about two minutes. So the last question will come from Representative Miller. Thank you, Mr. Kolb. I appreciate it greatly. Thanks for being here. Yesterday morning, I ran to Indiana and back. And while not many people can do that, too many of my constituents are running to Indiana and they're not coming back, unfortunately. And you talk about putting money back in people's pockets, which I greatly appreciate. I greatly appreciate the conversation on earned income tax credit and the pension tax repeal, however that looks. The thing is those will be budget implementation bills, but they will put money back in people's pockets. I think we're missing the elephant in the room though, the single greatest way to put money back in people's pockets is no-fault reform in this state. <clears throat> what is the governor's position on no-fault reform? The short answer is that no-fault's not in the budget, but I will tell you that there are conversations that have occurred and will be occurring to address uh, the cost of auto insurance in the state of Michigan. Uh, that is, you know, not what I'm here today to talk about. I do know the conversations have occurred, they will occur. She said in the state of the state, it's something she's open and wants to address. We all want to address that to, to lower those costs as well. There will be, you know, discussions going forward and I'm sure that collectively we will find an answer for that issue and for others before us. And today I'm looking forward to having more discussions on this budget to move Michigan forward. And I do want to say that this budget, if implemented, will provide an infusion 
of revenue into our economy that will employ Michiganders, Michigan businesses, to fix our roads, to fix our infrastructure, to improve our schools, to protect our water, and provide a, a budget that's structurally balanced and stable, and we can be proud of the state we live in, not just for today, for our children, and for our grandchildren. And I look forward to working with all of you uh, and moving this process forward, so thank you. Director and gentlemen, we truly appreciate the opportunity and the information today. Uh, we wish you well, and we look forward to uh, a lot of a discussion in the future. So thank you for being here. Thank you. The chair recognizes Senator Vice Chair Bumstead for a motion to adjourn the Senate. And supported by Senator Schmidt. So recognized, uh, Senate is now adjourned. And seeing no further business before the House Appropriations Committee, the committee stands adjourned.